We tend to think of our minds as if they were controlled by conscious reasoning. As if we start with a question and then carefully think through all the evidence and all the possible alternative answers. And then finally, after a lot of deliberation, decide on the best possible answer to that question. But that's not how the mind actually works. A lot of cognition, uh, non-conscious thinking, has to happen before conscious reasoning is even possible. Uh, conscious reasoning is the, the last stage in a long process of cognition. A lot of cognition has already been operating before the conscious mind even becomes aware of it. This is why the psychologist Jonathan Haidt uh, compares conscious awareness to a lawyer riding on the back of an elephant. The elephant in this uh, comparison represents all those parts of the mind that are processing information before that information is passed up to conscious awareness. And the lawyer riding on the back of the elephant would have almost no control over what the elephant did or where it went, but he would be very good at rationalizing whatever the elephant did after the fact. So if you imagine the elephant lumbering through a shopping mall, uh, knocking over kiosks and making people dive out of the way, uh, the lawyer couldn't stop it, but he could argue that those kiosks shouldn't have been there in the first place, or that the pedestrian should yield the right of way to all elephants. Uh, and this is, what Haidt is, is arguing that uh, the, the conscious mind usually does. It doesn't really direct our appetites, our actions, our reactions. Uh, it just sort of interprets them after the fact. Now, I wanna be sure that we're not thinking of the elephant as uh, the subconscious in the sort of psychoanalytic Freudian sense. That's kind of an outdated concept. Uh, but it is, it's something that we're not unconscious of. Uh, if you ever think of being at a, a party where a lot of people are having a lot of conversations uh, all over the place, you can't listen to all of those different conversations at once, you're just gonna focus on the conversation you're in. But if somebody in another conversation behind you says your name, all of a sudden you realize that person has said your name. Uh, you haven't been listening to what their conversation was, but part of your brain was taking in all this other information. It wasn't conscious until something alerted your consciousness that someone said your name. This is called a cocktail party effect. Well, that sort of, that cognition, all of that processing of information that's happening in the background, that's what the behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman calls system one. Um, he he's labels these two processes as system one thinking uh, or cognition, and then the conscious process as system two or reflective thinking. He says that system one thinking happens automatically and quickly with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. Whereas system two is much slower, it requires more deliberate effort. Uh, he explains it this way, quote, system one is in charge of almost everything we do. Most of everything we do is skilled and skilled activities are largely carried out effortlessly and automatically. That even includes routine conversation. It's very low effort. So system one is a marvel with some flaws. System two is slow and clunky, but capable of performing complicated actions that system one cannot carry out. For example, if I say uh, two plus two, a number comes into your mind, and that's system one working. You didn't have to compute it, you didn't have to do anything deliberate, it just popped out of your associative memory. But if I say 17 times 24, no number comes to your mind. You'd have to compute it, and if you computed it, you'd be investing effort. Uh, your pupils would get larger, your heart rate would accelerate, and you'd be working with system two, end quote. So if system one is carrying out all these everyday operations, uh, we see that it's very important, even though uh, it might not be able to carry out those higher order uh, operations. So when you look at these two pictures, which if you've watched the Michael Shermer video, uh, you've seen these already, but uh, Shermer shows us uh, these two pictures among others, and we look at them both and we immediately see a horse. Now, it doesn't take you very long to realize, okay, the picture on the left is not actually a horse, it's actually a cliff over the ocean, but you see immediately it looks like a horse. You didn't have to look at it and say, I see a lot of different shapes here, now I wonder what different types of images it could resemble. It just automatically pops in there. That's system one recognizing something rather than thinking about something. And on the, the picture on the right, uh, you see immediately a horse, and you have to actually stop yourself and say what else could be there if you're going to be able to see the frog picture, um, which is 
counterintuitive. It's, it's something we don't normally do. We don't normally stop to look for. But that recognition, uh, that processing of visual information and immediately coming up with a pattern, that is system one at work. And system one is great at pattern recognition. Uh, so when your mind is confronted with ambiguous information, ambiguous data, in this case visual information, you look to find some order to it. We don't look at a picture like this and just say, I don't, I don't think it's anything. Uh, we, want to, we want to match everything we see to something in our memories. We want to associate it with something. And in this case, uh, there's the, the image of a cow. This is a blurred, uh, degraded photo uh, of a cow. In this case, you can probably pretty quickly see the Dalmatian. And there are lots of other great examples of things that uh, you don't have to think about in order to see. If I asked you what sort of mood that book bag was in, that, that question shouldn't make any sense, but you know because you see that pattern, it looks like it's sort of an angry face. Whereas if I asked you what kind of mood that uh, barbecue pit was in, you'd probably say, well, he's feeling pretty cool right now, not because of the snow. This ability to see faces in things, it's something your mind is really uh, thoroughly programmed for. It's something that in our evolutionary history could have meant the, the difference between life and death. From the moment a child is born, that child looks at his mother's face constantly. Uh, that's the most uh, interesting thing. And when other faces come around, that child will be very interested in those faces. Whereas if you showed uh, a child an object like a remote control or uh, a book or something like that, uh, the, the child wouldn't be that interested. The, the child is building up a repertoire of patterns of faces. And so when we look at the rest of the world throughout our lives, faces are the first things that system one tends to come up with. Just getting through the world, there's way too much visual information in the world for you to process consciously. So imagine you're walking down a sidewalk and if you had to consciously examine every blade of grass and every brick in the wall that you walk past, uh, obviously you need to be aware of those things that you walk past, you know, because there might be a snake in the grass or uh, a closed door off to the side might swing open as you walk past it. So you can't be totally unconscious of these things. But that's why we evolved our non-conscious cognitive processes, our system one processes. These mental processes can take the background information and leave, they can process that background information and leave your conscious mind, your reflective mind, system two, free to concentrate on figuring out how to get from one place to another, or thinking about what you need to do later in the day, or remembering this incident that happened a, a couple of days ago. Now obviously, some of these patterns aren't actually there. There's not actually an angry face in that uh, book bag, although you can see it if you uh, look at it. Uh, that barbecue pit is not actually smiling and it's not actually wearing sunglasses. Uh, so pareidolia is misperceiving patterns in uh, vague or random information. Uh, seeing patterns that aren't actually there. Uh, if you can see the bear or the lion face and the, the fence on the right, you might get a clue as to why pareidolia is, a, is an advantageous concept, uh, an advantageous skill. Something that we evolved that helped us uh, in our evolutionary history even though it's frequently wrong. But a, a very common uh, one, a very common example of pareidolia is the face on Mars. Uh, back in the, the 70s, the Viking space probe passed by Mars and took these really grainy, low resolution pictures and sent them back to Earth. And we saw that uh, picture on the bottom left. Later, we get better information. Uh, we get uh, more detailed uh, topographical scans of the, the surface of Mars and we see that that face actually looks like uh, the, the pictures in the middle and on the right. But once people have seen that face, it's hard to uh, forget that face, that, that, that pattern which was not actually there, but once you're looking for it, it's kind of hard not to project it onto that. And misperceiving uh, patterns that aren't there actually becomes more common when we feel uh, like we've lost control, like we've, uh, if we feel insecure, if we feel threatened. And this uh, particular image comes from a study by Jennifer Whitson and Adam Galinsky, uh, just our, our neighbors to the north at the University of Texas at Austin. When they interviewed a lot of people in management careers, and they asked them to think about times in their past uh, one group they asked to think about a time in their past when they felt in control, when they had a problem to solve and they were able to solve that problem successfully. Those people wrote out uh, a short paragraph about the time they were in control. Another group wrote a short paragraph about a time when they felt like they had lost control, when they were unable to solve a problem, when they failed to complete a task. 
and they found that the first group, the ones who felt like they were in control, they would look at this image and they just saw a bunch of random phenomena. They say, I don't really see a pattern there. It's just a bunch of uh, black and white space. But the people who felt like they had lost control, the people who were reminded of a time when they were not in control of something, they looked at that image and much more often they would say that they saw something there. Now there's not actually a pattern there. This is just a randomly generated arrangement of uh, black and white color. But when people feel like they've lost control or that they feel threatened, they're much more likely to see patterns, see things that aren't really there. Now you can probably imagine how this could be an evolutionarily adaptive trait. Uh, so imagine you look down at the ground, out of the corner of your eye, you see uh, a cable on the ground. But immediately you think it's a snake and you jump back. And it turns out it wasn't a snake, no big deal. That's called a false positive pattern recognition. If you think you see a pattern, but it turns out not to be there, that's false positive. It's believing that there's a pattern is real when it's actually not. And we're much more likely to have a false positive pattern recognition moment than we are to have a false negative. That's where you look at something that actually is a pattern, it actually does exist in nature, but you don't notice it. Uh, in this case, you could see why that would be much more of a problem. If you don't notice that there actually is a snake in this picture, it's not one of the cords, but if you were to be uh, reach down and try to disconnect one of those cords, you might not see that there is a snake there, you might get bitten, and you might take yourself out of the gene pool. So whatever extra energy you waste uh, focusing on false positive patterns, it's it, it might be a waste of energy, you might embarrass yourself, you might just sort of be wrong for a while, but that's probably not gonna be as high a consequence as a false negative pattern recognition. But a false negative pattern recognition could get you killed even if it, used, even if it saved you a lot of time so this seems to be why we're hardwired, we're evolved to overreact to things, to see patterns all over the place, whether they're real or not. So we carry these patterns around in our head because they help us make sense of ambiguous information. Uh, so if I asked you to remember this list of words, if I told you that this was a, a memory task, and I went through these words one at a time and, and asked you to remember as many of these as you could. Uh, so let's do this experiment right now. Uh, remember the words thread, pin, eye, sewing, sharp, point, prick, thimble, haystack, thorn, hurt, injection, syringe, cloth, and knitting. Now, I'm going to give you a word and ask you if you heard that word in that last list or not. So the first word would be thread. Did you hear the word thread? The second word would be zebra. Did you hear the word zebra? What about the word needle? Now, most people, when they take this test, say, yes, and did I, yes, I did hear the word thread. No, I did not hear the word zebra, but yes, I did hear the word needle. Now, two of these are correct and one of them is wrong. So, you did hear the word thread. Most people say that they did hear the word thread and they're correct about that. They say that they did not hear the word zebra and they are also correct about that. But they say, they, they tend to say that yes, I did hear the word needle, but needle was not actually one of the words. If you look at the list again, you'll notice that there are a lot of things that have to do with needles, but needle is not one of the words itself. In other words, needles fit into this pattern. The word needle fits with the general pattern established by these words, but the word needle is not actually there. So what we've done is we've filled in something that didn't actually belong in that list. This is called the D. schrodinger mcdermott procedure. Uh, normally when this procedure would be given, you'd be shown one word at a time. Uh, you'd be told that it's just a test of memory. Uh, and when people know that it's a test of memory, they're trying to not forget something. What people tend to not realize is that when we're struggling really hard not to forget something, we might actually add things that aren't there. And so the patterns, this use of the patterns that are already in our heads is called associative coherence. That is, all these things fit together in this pattern, uh, but that provokes us to add bits of information into what we think is a pattern, even if that bit of information wasn't actually in what we experienced. So things that we usually experience or think of together start to seem as if they naturally belong together. We may even feel that they ought to be found together, even when they're not. And we apply this to much more everyday things, much more common things too. So here's another uh, psychological thought experiment. 
There's a woman named Linda, and she's 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in environmental awareness groups. Now, which of these characteristics are most likely to describe Linda? Rank them in order of likelihood. If we look at this list of characteristics on the left, we see that, okay, well, how likely is it that Linda is a teacher in an elementary school? Well, we might rank that a little bit lower in likelihood than that she is an act, that she's active in the feminist movement. Uh, it might be very likely that she's a psychiatric social worker. Uh, it might be less likely that she's a bank teller. What psychologists were actually getting at in this experiment was they wanted to see how these two letters, E and G, were ranked by the test subjects. They wanted to see if people thought it was more likely that Linda was a bank teller or more likely that she was a bank teller and an active feminist. Now, the active feminist part seems to fit that pattern that's established in the paragraph at the top someone who's, uh, who majors in philosophy and is concerned with social issues and social justice, that person we might think is more likely to fit a pattern that would also uh, make her a feminist. But the question is which one is more likely and statistically one of these is objectively more likely than the other. That is, it's objectively more likely that she is a bank teller than that she is a bank teller and a feminist. And I'll tell you why in just a second if you don't already know. But first I want to do another version of this uh, experiment. Which of these events is more likely? There's a massive flood somewhere in North America next year in which more than a thousand people drown. Or that there's an earthquake in California sometime next year that causes a flood in which more than a thousand people drown. Logically, it should be obvious that because the second alternative is actually contained within the first alternative, that the first alternative is the one that's the most likely. So either way, whichever one of these happens, uh, there will be a massive flood somewhere in the United States in which more than a thousand people drown. So the second option is actually a much more narrow subset of the first. Just like it's uh, the idea that Linda is a bank teller and a feminist is a subset of the characteristic that she's a bank teller. But that's not what we focus on. We tend to uh, focus on the patterns in our head, the associative coherence of earthquakes in California being likely events, and uh, women who major in philosophy and are active in social justice being feminist. These patterns and the, the coherence or the feeling of coherence they give us are helpful. They help us get through the everyday world without having to rethink everything that we interact with. But they can be problematic. Both of these experimental questions come from the behavioral economist Daniel Kahneman. And Kahneman has been uh, researching this sort of thing for uh, over uh, 40 years now. Kahneman says, coherence has a cost. Coherence means that you're going to adopt one interpretation in general. Ambiguity tends to be suppressed. This is part of the mechanism that you have here that ideas activate other ideas, and the more coherent they are, the more likely they are to activate each other. Other things that don't fit fall by the wayside. We're enforcing a coherent interpretation. We see the world as much more coherent than it is. The confidence that people have in their beliefs is not a measure of the quality of the evidence. It's just a judgment of the coherence of the story that the mind has managed to construct. Quite often you can construct very good stories out of very little evidence. People tend to have great belief, great faith in the stories that are based on very little evidence. So if you read the uh, article in the Boston Globe by the physician and medical researcher Jerome Grootman that I assigned for the class, you read about this woman named Leslie who had a type of stomach cancer and she knew something was wrong but when she went to the doctor they assumed that her stomach issues were coming from stress. Uh, they saw a pattern which is uh, Leslie had just had her third child and uh, it was very likely that she was undergoing a lot of stress at home and they assumed that well there is a, a, a frequent occurrence between stress and stomach problems so that's probably what there is. But what they found out was actually no, they overlooked another pattern that was less frequent and less familiar but actually much more dangerous and that is that uh, Leslie actually had this uh, stomach tumor. Now Grootman tells this story as a means to show that people, even very intelligent, very highly educated people like these doctors that uh, Leslie visits, tend to make a certain kind of mistake that doesn't come from ignorance, but it comes from th jumping to conclusions too quickly. Uh, seeing a pattern and assuming that that pattern is all you need to see too quickly. 
So Groupman is not only a, a doctor, but a medical researcher, a researcher who focuses on the way doctors think. In fact, this uh, article comes from a book called How Doctors Think that he wrote, and this is after years of studying doctors uh, in practice. Groupman uses this ex anecdote as an example to illustrate the kind of thing that can happen with doctors or with anybody else. Um, where we see a pattern, we recognize a pattern, that's a system one activity, the pattern just jumps right out at us, and that pattern is uh, frequently a heuristic. A heuristic is sort of a rule of thumb where in this case, if you do this, it will solve this problem. And a heuristic is a strategy that works a lot of the time, maybe even most of the time, but it doesn't work all the time. For example, you've probably heard the rule uh, for spelling, use I before E except after C. That's a heuristic that if you can't think of whether or not you should put the I first or the E first in a word, uh, go by that rule and you'll usually get it right. Usually, but not always. If you were trying to spell yield or ceiling or receive, then you would have gotten it right if you'd followed that rule, but if you tried to spell there or eight or sees, then you would have gotten it wrong. So heuristic is a rule or a piece of information used as a method of problem solving or decision making, often derived through relatively unstructured methods such as trial and error or conventional wisdom. A heuristic may work to solve problems most of the time, but we don't want to rely on it all the time. Unfortunately for Leslie, her doctors used that heuristic, they saw the pattern, they said this fits this heuristic, and so they misattributed a cause to her symptoms. So this was an attribution error. We'll come back to attribution errors later when we talk about stasis of uh, causation. But they anchored onto that heuristic. They said, this is probably what it is, and once you're anchored on something, it's hard to move away from it. And that leads to this feeling that you found the answer you need. That feeling is called closure. Closure is going from a situation where you feel anxious because you don't know what to make of uh, ambiguous information to coming up with a pattern that seems to explain that ambiguous information and you feel like you don't need to keep looking. So they had the feeling of closure, but it was premature closure. And then, just to check themselves, they went to look and see were there other, uh, other pieces of evidence that would confirm that that pattern was real, that that attribution was correct. So uh, if a, a, a stomach problem is frequently caused by stress, you would ask Leslie, do you have any reason why you would be feeling stressed? And she would say, yes, I just had my third child. And you'd say, aha, there's the confirmation that the pattern I saw was true. Uh, the problem is confirmation bias doesn't always help. And the feeling of closure can actually cause us to stop looking for an answer before we've actually gotten the right answer. But we all have a need for closure. We don't like not knowing. There's a, a certain need for closure that exists at certain levels in everybody all the time. So psychologists look at this need for closure and see how, uh, to see how it affects our thinking. And they find that individuals that are high in a need for closure have a tendency to seek immediate and permanent answers, desiring not only to form judge judgments urgently, but also to attain trans situationally stable rather than transitory answers. Now, basically what that means is we want to hurry up and find an answer once we realize there's something we don't know. But once we've found that answer, we want that answer to apply to as many situations as possible. We want a heuristic like I before E except after C, and I want that to work on every word out there. I want that to always always be all I need to know. I don't want to have to rethink each new situation and come up with a new rule for each new situation. So that's what they mean by transsituationally stable. Uh, the, the problem is heuristics aren't transsituationally stable. They work sometimes, but uh, not all the time. But what we want is to, as these psychologists uh, say, we want to seize on an answer and then freeze on that answer. Uh, as soon as I'm confronted with the fact that I don't know something, that there's a problem to solve, I want to get an answer as soon as possible, but once I find that answer, I want to just stick with that answer. I don't want to have to keep looking. I want the, the, the search for new information to be done. And that leads us to latch on to abstract knowledge that uh, makes us feel like it, it's consistent, that it's all we need to know, and it's, it can be applied across different situations. Uh, and we also want other people to say, yes, that is all you really need to know. We don't like it when people question our answers. But that's all a feeling, and that feeling can be very deceptive. If you were Leslie and your doctors misdiagnosed you, you would want them to not seize and freeze. You would want them to keep looking just in case. Even if there was a low likelihood that something other than stress was causing her stomach discomfort, you would want those doctors to keep looking. So in this situation, you would see that the feeling of closure is actually a problem. 
And what you do when you get to a, a, an answer, an answer that makes you feel confident, whether or not you keep looking after that is much more important than you might expect. So if you want to test yourself and see how quickly you're satisfied with your answer, try this uh, problem. Imagine there's a bat and a ball that cost $1.10 in total. I know this is probably a very old problem before uh, a few decades of inflation. But let's just imagine there's a bat and a ball that cost $1.10 total. The bat cost $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now you probably had an answer that just popped right into your head. Now what do you do with that answer? Do you blurt out what you th that, that answer or do you say, wait a second, uh, let me add those two things together? We all come to the same intuitive answer pretty quickly. The question is, what do we do with that intuitive answer? The intuitive answer, of course, is 10 cents. But critical thinkers will check their answers before saying them out loud. Uh, and when I say critical thinkers, don't take this the wrong way if you got it wrong. If you said, well, it seems like it's 10 cents, uh, that's okay, everybody does. Would you have written that down or would you have told that to someone else if there was someone else there? Or would you have waited and added the two things together? Because that intuitive answer, 10 cents, if we say, okay, the ball is 10 cents and uh, the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, that means that the bat costs 10 cents plus one dollar, so it's a dollar and 10 cents, and therefore the bat and the ball together would cost a dollar 20 cents, but we were told that the bat and the ball together cost one dollar and 10 cents. Now, uh, everybody goes through the same process, but the, the key factor is when you have that feeling of closure. If you have that feeling of closure as soon as you came to the 10 cents intuitive answer, that might be a problem, but don't worry, it's something we can work on. This comes from what the behavioral economist Shane Frederick designed and called the cognitive reflection task. Uh, there are three basic questions. What these questions have in common is not that they're really that difficult, but they have a really intuitive answer that's wrong. And if you catch that intuitive answer, you can come to the right answer pretty quickly and pretty easily. But it all depends on how dependent you are on that feeling of closure, how quickly you anchor your, to the first answer. That little voice in your head that says 10 cents as soon as it hears the problem, that's the elephant. That's your automatic cognitive processes working in the background and feeding up this answer to your reflective consciousness, to system two, to the lawyer on the back of the elephant. And what that uh, system two lawyer does with the answer is what the, the real test is. So the cognitive ref reflection task is designed to see who's using system two to check the inferences of system one before they decide on an answer. And people with a high need for closure tend to answer quickly but inaccurately. Uh, but people with a low need for closure tend to take uh, time to critically evaluate the answers. Now, uh, the, the same person can be high or low in the need for closure depending on the situation. If you're in a hurry, uh, if you're uh, worried about something, you might depend on system one too much. You're gonna have a higher need for closure if you have a deadline approaching or if you have someone standing over your shoulder, looking over your shoulder as you're trying to do a problem. We wanna think about how we can dampen down our need for closure. How we can try to make ourselves, force ourselves to be more patient before jumping to a conclusion or presuming that there's a pattern there that may not actually be there. So let's say I'm gonna to try to be low in need for closure. I'm gonna to try to validate uh, whatever my assumption is. Let's try this next problem. I have a secret rule for arranging these three numbers in this order. Guess my secret rule for selecting these numbers, and to test that speculation of what you think the rule is, offer up three other numbers of your own using the rule that you think is in play. And then I will either uh, confirm uh, your guess or deny your guess. But remember, you can't ask me the rule. All you can do is come up with three other numbers and ask me if they fit the rule or not. So here's what most people do. Most people will come up with number sequences like eight, 10, 12. 14, 16, 18, or 92, 94, 96. Uh, and in this case, yes, they all fit the same rule. The same rule that led me to determine the three numbers two, four, and six would also lead me to add 92, 94, and 96 to that list. However, you might then guess, oh, well, it's the rule is even numbers increasing uh, by two each time. Uh, and if that was your guess, that's wrong. But how could it be wrong? If 8, 10, 12 fits that same rule, they're even numbers increasing by two each time. 92, 94, 96 are also even numbers. They increase by two each time. How could the rule not be even numbers increasing by two each time? Well, you might have figured this out if you'd, instead of asking even numbers, instead of asking 
whether or not these numbers that fit what you think the rule is work. Instead, try to get it wrong. Try to say, well, I don't think uh, one, two, three would fit, but let me ask just in case. Uh, I don't think even numbers going backwards would work, but let me try just in case. Let me ask if six, four, two, if that would fit into the sequence. Let me ask if one, 17, 33 fits into the sequence. If you had, you might have gotten one of those wrong, but you would have unexpectedly gotten two of them right. And in this case, getting two right means that your rule isn't quite uh, what the actual rule is. So if one, two, three fits the rule, then it must not be just even numbers and it must not just be increasing by two. If one, 17, 133 fits the rule, then those are increasing by two different uh, quantities. So that also invalidates the rule that it's even numbers increasing by two. These two uh, sets of test answers uh, show two different types of uh, strategies that people use to test patterns or uh, assumptions that they have about information that they're trying to understand. The first three are examples of confirmation bias. This is when we want to test uh, an assumption or a pattern, so we look for examples that would show that we are correct. And we can find those, uh, in most cases, pretty easily. Uh, the problem is confirmation isn't actually a very good test. If you wanted to confirm that the Earth is flat and that the sun goes around it, rather than the Earth going around the sun, uh, you can just look around. In fact, this is unfortunately making a comeback. There is a flat Earth society that is soberly and apparently not joking when they argue that the Earth is in fact flat. But we have confirming evidence for the the statement that the Earth is flat. If you look out at the horizon, uh, if you look in the east in the morning, you'll see the sun coming up and you'll see it go overhead during the day, and you look west in the afternoon and you'll see it going down. So that is confirming evidence. The thing is, uh, people like Nicholas Copernicus and Galileo weren't just looking at that, they were looking at other pieces of evidence like, why doesn't the planet Venus rise and set in the same place throughout the year? Why does it tend to be all over the sky? Uh, those are anomalies that led people to second guess that pattern and say, hey, our sense of closure might need to be uh, undone. It might actually be causing us more problems. And what they did in those cases was falsification. They said, if this thing is true, and I try this experiment, I should not get this result. But when they run the experiment, they actually do get the result. So they set out to try to disconfirm a pattern rather than trying to confirm it. And if you fail to disconfirm a hypothesis, that's about as close as you can get to being sure that that hypothesis is, is correct. So this decision that you make when you hear the bat and the ball problem, or when you see these uh, three numbers, the decision that pops into your mind immediately, sometimes really without your awareness, is a question, do I know enough to make a decision? Do I know enough to act on yet? And if you're high in the need for closure, you're more likely to say yes, to seize on an answer and freeze on it and wanna just use that answer, hoping it applies to everything. But if you're low in need for closure, or if you manage to get yourself in a state where you're low in the need for closure, uh, you're a little bit more patient, you're a little bit more willing to uh, use a lot of system two effort and deliberation before deciding on an answer, then you're ready to try falsification uh, rather than just confirmation bias. Then you realize, I may not know enough yet. And being aware that you don't know enough, uh, remember from my first lecture, this is Socratic wisdom. This is a good thing. Unfortunately, it's not a very common thing. So Daniel Kahneman, again, did this uh, experiment. He brought people in and asked them to imagine that they were jurors in a small claims court uh, dispute between uh, a union organizer and a drugstore salesman. And all the people that were asked to imagine that they were jurors were given this same story about what the specific dispute was, but some people in the group were, besides being given this information, they had someone acting as the lawyer for the union representative. And some people had uh, a lawyer acting for the drugstore. And some people had lawyers for both sides. What Kahneman really wanted to get to was how confident were the people that only had one side of the story. If you had this information in this court case and you only heard the lawyer for one side rather than the other, would you feel more confident in deciding who was right and who was wrong or would you feel less confident? Would you be wanting to wait and hear the other side of the story? Unfortunately, what Kahneman found 
was that the people who only heard one side of the story, even though they knew they only heard one side of the story, were actually more confident, more uh, ready to decide on who was at fault and who was in the right, than the people who heard both sides. The people who heard both sides were actually less confident. Uh, they were uh, more aware that this was a complicated situation. Now, we would like to think of ourselves as relatively self-aware, people who uh, know when we don't know something. But uh, over and over again, this is what psychologists don't find. We, they tend to find instead, we're a little too confident, we're a little too ready to trust system one, to trust that automatic cognition, rather than stopping ourselves and saying, hey, wait, do I know all I need to know to make a decision on this? Now, Kahneman points out that we tend to fall for this bias that he calls, what you know is all there is. Uh, whatever it is you, you see in a particular situation, you tend to say, that's all I need to know. Uh, I don't need to keep looking for more information. This is what happened with Leslie's doctors when they uh, decided that she had this uh, stomach issue, even though uh, they didn't keep looking at the information that was there that was available. As Jerome Groupman points out, they actually had information there from a blood test that should have let them know that there was a possibility of a tumor, but they thought they had all the information they needed. Uh, the people asked to act as jurors in this situation thought they knew all the information they needed to know, even though they knew they only heard from one side, rather than hearing both sides. And this assumption that what you know is all there is, or what you see is all, all there is, uh, can become potentially dangerous. During World War II, a lot of bombers were coming back after a bombing run over uh, the Axis territories. They were landing at, at Allied airstrips uh, covered with bullet holes from anti-aircraft weapons, from uh, the enemy fighters. And so the Air Force wanted to, or the Army Air Corps wanted to put armor on these planes, but they couldn't put armor over the entire plane. It would make the plane too heavy to fly. It wouldn't be able to carry this payload of bombs uh, in addition to you know the crew and, and all the other weight. So they had to put armor just in certain areas. And they said, well, they, they created composite maps like this one that showed all the different places where all the different planes that came back uh, were damaged. And they decided, hey, let's just put armor over these places. But uh, Abraham Wald, who was a Hungarian statistician, uh, he recognized that actually, no, those are the places you don't need to put armor. It's not that that's the only areas where these planes are getting hit, but the planes that get hit in those areas, they're able to make it back. The ones that get hit in the cockpit, the ones that get hit in the engines, the ones that get hit in the fuselage where the bombs are, those are the ones that don't come back. So that's where you need to put the armor. And you'll still get planes coming back with holes in all these places, but they're still gonna come back. That's, uh, Abraham Wald recognized that what you see is not all there is, that he did not have all the information he needed. He resisted that feeling of closure and recognized that he needed to keep thinking, uh, rethinking and rethinking what that system one automatic process delivered up to his conscious awareness. So what we think we know doesn't always measure up to what we actually know. Another way to test this is to just explain something. If you think you know something really well, you're probably responding to the familiarity, the how well that object fits into your uh, the patterns that you have in your head, how coherent it is with uh, the, the things that you're familiar with. And uh, the psychologist Francis Kyle uh, calls this the illusion of explanatory depth. If you think you know something, try explaining it. Uh, if you wanna find out how well somebody knows how a helicopter works, you can ask them first, are you familiar with a helicopter? Could you explain how a helicopter works? Notice before you ask them to actually explain it, just ask them if they can. And they will probably say yes, I can say how a helicopter works. Uh, here on campus, right next to the Naval Air Station, we see helicopters flying over all the time. There's something that's very familiar to us, they're part of our everyday world. Now, can you explain how it works? Well, okay, it's got something to do with the propeller. Uh, the propeller turns and there's lift and uh, yeah, that's, that's how a helicopter works. It's not a very good description, is it? It's not what I thought I could tell you before you asked. And so uh, Kyle uh, did this experiment with a lot of people. He would ask them first, can you explain how a helicopter works? They would usually be pretty confident, but then he would ask them to actually explain how a helicopter works, and then they would realize, hey, I actually don't have that much, that, that detailed an understanding of what's happening. 
Okay, well, that's a helicopter, so you're not an aeronautical engineer, big deal. What about something as simple as a bicycle? Uh, Rebecca Lawson asked people whether or not they were familiar with bicycles, and including people who rode bicycles frequently. And they asked them, could you fill in the missing pieces on this diagram of a bicycle? And she even labels the parts of the diagram, the, sh the thick lines of the frame, the dotted line is the chain that they have to add in, and then there's the, the, the pedals. And she asked them, can you put the pedals and the chain where they go on this bicycle? And she didn't even ask them sometimes, uh, uh, most of the time all they had to do was choose between which of these four is accurate. So if you know what a bicycle looks like, if you grew up riding a bicycle, if you ride a bicycle here on campus like I do, you probably think, oh, this is something I know very well, I could do this very easily. And for number three, she would say, okay, which of these is the accurate uh, portrayal of the frame? For number four, she would say, where does the, the pedal usually go? Uh, and then number five, where does the chain usually go? And surprisingly, people, even people who rode bikes frequently, in this case, uh, the male who uh, did answer A uh, is someone who described himself as cycling at least once a month. And the female in uh, answer C is someone who said she cycled uh, most days. And yet, if you look at their drawings, respondent A put his pedals in the front uh, and the chain going across both wheels. And uh, answer C put the uh, pedals about where they go, but then had the chain going across both wheels. In both of those cases, the, the bike wouldn't actually work. So in these cases, we have a confusion between the illusion of knowledge, the illusion of explanatory depth, this recognizing a pattern that you don't normally have to think too much about. Recognizing some coherent model that you don't usually have to think too far into. Uh, you just have a, a utilitarian awareness. I know enough to uh, use my computer, I know enough to you know, click here and, and type the, on the keys, but I wouldn't be able to uh, do much uh, reprogramming if I had to go in and write code in the computer. Uh, if I ride my bike, I don't have to think about how it works in order for it to work. And this illusion of explanatory depth gets even worse when we're online. So I asked you to read the article about the study done by Matthew Fisher, Mario Gadu, and Francis Kyle about the way using the internet uh, inflates our illusion of explanatory depth or illusion of understanding. And the article that you read in the Telegraph tells you some of this, but in Fisher and his uh, co-author's study, they brought people in and uh, put them into two groups. One group, they said, we're gonna ask you some of these questions like, uh, how do zippers work? How well could you explain that? Or why are there leap years? Or how is glass made? And you can look this up on the internet. And in some cases, they even gave them the, the, the site to look at to, to find that answer. And they asked another group, the control group, the same questions, but they didn't give them access to the internet. Then in the second phase, uh, both groups again were asked questions and they were asked how well could you explain this thing? And it would be a completely different issue. Uh, it would be something like how do scientists know that the universe is expanding? Or why can't x-rays penetrate lead? Or uh, why can't you drink while taking antibiotics? And both groups knew they couldn't use the internet but the group who had just used the internet to find their answer was much more confident in how well they'd be able to find an answer or explain an answer, even knowing that they wouldn't be able to use the internet. Whereas the group who was not able to use the internet, they were pretty modest, they were uh, pretty self-aware uh, that they would only be able to partially uh, answer this particular question. So even though they knew they wouldn't have access to the same uh, resources, before, the people who had gotten used to using the internet had a much larger assumption about how much they knew. They had a much greater illusion of their own explanatory depth. And all of these experiments have in common that they were researching how people think about the way that they think. So Jerome Groupman's investigations into the ways doctors think, uh, as well as uh, Francis Kyle's uh, illusion of explanatory depth, uh, these are all experiments in metacognition. So if cognition is system one, that's all of this thinking that takes place in the background of your mind that you're not always aware of. Metacognition is how you use that uh, thinking and then how, you, how aware you are of how much knowledge that you have. 
how aware you are of what your limitations are. This is metacognition, so cognition about cognition. In a, an interview, Matthew Fisher, who did that, uh, that Google study, says that metacognitive awareness is people's ability to assess how well they can explain the things around them. And these psychologists find that metacognition is something we're constantly doing, but it's not something we're very good at. Uh, we're way too overconfident most of the time when it comes to assessing our own abilities. Uh, reality is more complicated than we usually realize. There's a lot more components to the things that we're familiar with than we actually have to think about on a daily basis. So as you develop your metacognition, uh, your system to the lawyer on the back of the elephant, you're confronted with a choice. Do you just continue to make excuses for all of these uh, unexamined thoughts that are popping out of your head? Do you go where the elephant wants to go? Do you blurt out the first impression and then use confirmation bias to try to defend it? Or do you slow down, deliberate, try to falsify your speculations, try to find out how much you don't know first, and then try to steer the elephant in a different direction? That exercise of system two is difficult and it uses a lot of energy and it takes a lot of time. And when you realize something is complicated, if you realize you're gonna have to spend some time using system two, using deliberative metacognition uh, and, and deliberative thinking to map out a lot of components, a lot of moving parts to a, a complicated thing, uh, say if you're doing a really complicated math problem, then you wanna get out a pencil and paper. You wanna write down the different parts and look, test different uh, descriptions, test different patterns to see what works and what doesn't. And as we're going to see next time, that's what writing an essay is. Uh, you're taking your thinking, you're putting it on paper, and once it's there, once it's sort of set out and, and out of your mind, uh, you no longer have to depend on feelings. You can then look at it, you can map it out, you can cross out the parts that are wrong, you can write in uh, missing information that needs to be there. and you can recognize which of your assumptions are not validated. They might be part of a pattern, but they're not part of the actual data you have to work with.